This is the next lecture. It's chapter two in the text, and we're just going to go through the slides and talk about a few other concepts. Last time, we talked about stress, and stress is a force per area that exists in material that's solid material. It's like pressure in liquid, except there's some fundamental differences. While it has the same units as pressure, pressure in a liquid is basically whatever it's just normal to whatever surface it's touching. So whatever surface the fluid is touching, the pressure is just normal to that surface. Stress, on the other hand, can exist in any direction, really, in material. And there's, But we did break it down into two types of stress. There was shear stress and normal stress. And those are the two types of stress we'll always deal with, is shear and normal stress. Now we looked at a simple version of normal stress that was direct normal stress, and we looked at a simple version of shear stress that was direct shear stress. So we're just considering these very simple cases where the stress itself is uniform uh, along the surface that's being cleaved. Now we're going to talk about a new concept, it's strain. If you think about stress as a force or the, the action that's causing change, strain is the change, it's the response to the stress. It's how the material stretches, uh, if you will, in response to or in generation of the stress. So anyway, uh, the strain equation we're going to use is total deformation divided by original length. So if you think of, think of just a square block made out of uh, rubber. If you take that square block of rubber and you stretch it and you want to know what the strain is, well, all you have to do is measure the original dimensions of, say, the length, for example, of the cube of rubber and measure the deformation, okay, not, not the total new length, but just the change in length, that deformation over the original length is strain. And we give it this symbol, uh, uh, well, what symbol is that? It's not sigma, epsilon, sorry, uh, couldn't think for a minute. Sigma is used for normal stress. So we use the symbol epsilon to indicate strain. Now notice something about the units. The deformation would have units of length just as the original length had units of length. And so those two divided by one another means that we're dealing now with a dimensionless quantity. So strain is a dimensionless quantity. Strain is something easy to imagine if you think about a mine. If you have a mine, basically a hole in the ground, with a cable that extends down into the mine for lifting material out or lowering tools and, and items down, uh, that cable is going to be fairly long. And that cable is going to deflect due to weight that it carries. So in our slides over here, um, here's our metal wire with some cross-sectional area A0 and some original length L0. And that wire then is stretched due to a weight F or force from that weight being added uh, to the wire. So there's a significant amount of change in length because of the weight that's applied to that wire. And one of the ways that this helps your intuition is that the, the, uh, the metal wire would be very long. So you can imagine that it would be a significant deformation by the time you get down into the mine. If you want something uh, physical that you can play with to think about this, take a rubber band and don't put any force on it, but just hold it up in the you know, longest length that you can get without putting force on it. And then put a weight on it and see the, the rubber band deflect. And that deformation represents some strain. So that deformation over the original length would be the strain of the rubber band. Now, when a material stretches, and let's go back to the rubber band. If you take a piece of rubber or a rubber band and you stretch it, what you'll notice is that the cross section will get thinner. The dimensions will actually get thinner. Um, now, when you stretched your dog bone in lab, you notice that it necked down, but it was necking down due to failure, starting to yield. If you were to release the, the stress on it, release the force, on the dog bone, what would happen is it would be deformed. The, the necking down would remain. But if you measured it carefully as you were going, as you applied more and more load to the dog bone, before yielding ever occurred, and don't worry, we'll define yielding a little bit later, but before yielding ever occurred, you could actually measure the width of the dog bone and you would find that it was decreasing along the entire uh, thin section as you apply force and stretch the do dog bone. Poisson's ratio is something that uh, quantifies that effect. So basically what's happening is the length of the material is getting longer, but the width of the material is getting uh, lower. It's, it's decreasing, it's shortening. So Poisson's ratio is simply the uh, ratio of the lateral strain, the sideways strain, the, the not necking down, but the decrease in width, to the axial uh, strain. 
So notice we're talking about a ratio of two parameters, both of which are dimensionless, and so Poisson's ratio is also a dimensionless thing, although it's a ratio of two things that are in different directions. One's lateral and the other one's axial. Now notice there's a negative sign at the upper uh, lateral strain because the strain is the, the lateral strain is going to be negative, right? Because it's getting shorter. It's not getting longer. So the deflection is actually a negative deflection. So the strain is a negative thing and therefore we need this negative sign so that Poisson's ratio comes out as a positive ratio. Uh, here's another figure I have that I really like. If you think about it, uh, the uh, let me point out the green cube represents the original unstretched uh, um, element. But then when you apply an axial force to this cube, then it changes to the shape of the red cube that's inside of it. You're, hopefully you're looking at these slides as we talk. And that, that red cube, notice, is longer, but it's not as wide in either of the lateral directions. So there's, uh, again, we can talk about uh, Poisson's ratio, and if we're talking about a material that's isotropic, in other words, has the same properties in all directions, like steel typically is, or aluminum, uh, or any metal for that matter, um, that doesn't have a significant um, process direction. Um, in, in all of those, the lateral strain in both um, both dimensions will be the same. So the, your, the Poisson's ratio will be the same for both um, side dimensions or lateral dimensions. So uh, let's see. Uh, Poisson's ratio has a theoretical range from zero to a half. And I apologize, I just realized in these slides we've got uh, N instead of nu. The symbol I should have mentioned for Poisson's ratio is that weird script V. That's actually a, a Greek character. It's a lowercase nu is what it's actually called. And this should be lowercase nu. I'll try to fix that before you download the slides. But anyway, um, so the theoretical range for Poisson's ratio is from zero to a half. Metals typically exhibit Poisson's ratios from about a quarter to 0.35. Steel is about 0.3. Concrete is anywhere from about a tenth or so to a quarter. And rubber approaches the theoretical maximum of uh, a half. So one thing to realize is that Poisson's ratio of a half represents an incompressible solid, a solid that doesn't change volume as it changes, as it, as it strains. So also there's a um, table here with representative values for Poisson's ratios for several different um, uh, metals, aluminum, steel, gold, brass, things like that. Now here's something interesting. When you think about what happens with axial strain, that makes sense, right? I mean, we can stretch materials. It doesn't seem like they stretch much, but they do stretch some. So you, you can think about you know, a cable and pulling it, or a rubber band and pulling it, and certainly it will stretch and it will strain. However, there's another type of strain uh, that is called shear strain. In fact, let me back up just a little bit. The strain we've talked about so far is strain that is due to normal stress. So if I have a long body and I apply a force, an axial force to it, think of a, a, a member in a bridge, if I apply an axial force, it will actually change length, and that is just, I guess you could call it direct strain or normal strain. But there's also shearing strain. You can actually take material and cause it to change angle. In other words, uh, the shearing stress you apply can cause a change in shape that is more of a rotational type of phenomenon. Uh, you can think of this intuitively by thinking of a, a block of jello. Okay, think about it just a, a cube of jello where the bottom of the cube is sitting on a table, the top of the cube you put your hand on and you apply some sheer stress to it, some sheer force to it. And what happens? Well, the sides will change angle, right? They'll no longer be perpendicular. Well, that's what you need to think of when you think of shearing strain because shear stress causes shearing strain. Uh, it's measured in radians, and so if you look here at our figure, gamma, this symbol here, this lowercase gamma, is the angular measure, and it's in uh, radians. It's the resulting change in angle of that, the side of the jello, if you want to think about it that way, as a result of the shearing stress. In the real world, this value uh, of gamma, this angle change, is really very small. It's, it's not like jello, where you'd have a significant visible angle change, but it's still very real and still exhibit. Just like if you think about taking, I don't know, a, a concrete block and putting force on either end and compressing it, it will change its length, although it's very small. In the same way, apply a shearing stress to that concrete blo block and it will exhibit some shearing strain, but it'll be very small and hardly noticeable. 
All right, so the next thing we need to talk about is the elastic modulus, or the modulus of elasticity, or Young's modulus is, is what it's usually called. Uh, and it's basically just the ratio of stress to strain. It, go, let's go back to a comparison between, say, concrete and jello. All right, if I take jello and I apply a compressive force to it, it's going to strain, right? It's going to change dimension quite a lot to a relatively small stress. Let's think of stress instead of force. But if I do the same thing to a similarly sized block of concrete, it's not going to strain hardly in, at all. So the ratio of stress to strain is a, a property we're very interested in because we typically want materials that are fairly stiff, materials that do not change their s dimension very much for relatively high stresses. If you think about things like metals, most metals, especially steel, doesn't change its length for a fairly large applied uh, stress. Something like going back to rubber bands and jello, well, a fairly small stress will cause a fairly large a relatively large strain. So if you look at the elastic modulus, it's the ratio of stress to strain. So if you can have a fairly large stress and yet exhibit a fairly low strain, you have a high elastic modulus. That would be concrete, steel, things like that. But if a relatively small uh, stress causes a relatively large strain, then the elastic modulus is going to be much smaller, and that's a fairly uh, weak, no, I don't want to say weak because I'm not talking about the strength, the fracture strength. It's a fairly unstiff, a fairly flexible material. Okay. All right, so basically the elastic modulus is a measure of the stiffness of the material. The higher the elastic modulus, the stiffer the material. Uh, it, and a, th a thing to note, the elastic modulus can actually be different in tension than it is in compression. If you think of a bridge member and you compress it, it can have a different elastic modulus in compression than it has in tension. Now, typically steels and metals, their elastic modulus in tension and compression are very close. They're basically the same. But things like concrete have different, is it concrete? I may be misspeaking there. Uh, concrete has a different strength in tension versus compression, but I'm not sure if concrete has a different modulus in tension versus compression. I'd have to look that, but there are materials that have different moduli in tension versus compression. All right, so basically, why would we want something stiff? Well, so that it can carry a significant load without deflection. So uh, here's a, a relative comparison of steel, aluminum, and polystyrene. Polystyrene is a type of plastic uh, where we've got a 10-pound load on a uh, beam, and you notice that the steel has a fairly high elastic modulus of 30 times 10 to the 6 PSI. It's a number you should commit to memory because regardless of the alloy, most steels exhibit a modulus of about that number. Uh, aluminum ha is not as stiff. It's uh, 10 times 10 to the 6, so a third of the stiffness of steel, and it will deflect a, a proportional amount more. So if the steel deflects an inch, the aluminum would deflect 3 inches. And then we've got polystyrene, which is much less stiff. You see its elastic modulus is much lower than the steel and aluminum, and it will deflect proportionally more. Now, in reality, some materials exhibit nonlinear behavior, uh, and that's a, an important point and since we're going to talk about deflection. The theories we're working with here in this class are really constrained by two things. I don't think I've got this in the slides anywhere else, but I'm going to mention it now. Two things it's constrained by. Number one, the materials we deal with have to be isotropic. What that means is that the materials have to exhibit the same behavior regardless of the direction. So if I have a block of material and I squish it this way horizontally or vertically or from the, the, the sides, it will exhibit the same type of strain if I apply the same force. That's an isotropic material. If you think about something like wood or a composite material, these are things, these are materials that have different properties in different directions. Wood is very easy to cleave along the grain, whereas it's very difficult to cleave across uh, the grain, right? Uh, so wood is not an isotropic material. The theories we're working with here can still be applied to wood in special situations, but you've got to know the limitations of the theory that we're dealing with. Uh, and you've got to understand that different mater some materials, like wood especially, and like I said, uh, composites, exhibit different properties depending on the direction that you're dealing with. If you're applying a load normal to the surface of a composite versus uh, uh, along the surface of a composite, you'll get different results, different material behavior. Um, and, and further, uh, 
A lot of materials, even steels and things, will exhibit nonlinear behaviors as the load increases and the strain increases. So the theories we're dealing with here are only good for really small strains. Now fortunately, that's usually the case with fairly stiff materials. So you have to be cautious when you apply the theories we're working with in this class to materials that are either not isotropic or where you expect large strains as a result of the stress applied to the material. So here's a relative um, chart that shows you the stress versus strain for a few different materials, magnesium, aluminum, aluminum titanium, and steel. <clears throat> and you may be surprised to see that titanium does not have as large an elastic modulus as steel. What does that mean? That means it's not as stiff. Titanium can be stronger than steel, but, in fact, that's why it's commonly used, but it's not as stiff. And so we've got to start um, separating these properties out and understanding the, the differences between them. So uh, steel can actually be stiffer, but frequently not as strong as titanium. Aluminum, on the other hand, is not as stiff or as strong as either titanium or steel, but it has a much lighter um, density. It has a much higher strength uh, per weight, basically. So that's something that can be valuable. Um, so what we've plotted here is the, uh, s essentially the elastic modulus. The elastic modulus would be the slope of any of these curves. And what we've got on the x-axis is strain, on the y-axis we have stress. And since the elastic modulus is just the ratio of stress to strain, then the elastic modulus could be uh, used to plot these curves or to uh, uh, be calculated from these curves, either way. But you'll notice that basically the slope of any of these lines, in other words the elastic modulus, changes it. I, I really don't like, this is from your text of course, I really don't like the way that the author has set this up where the elastic modulus points to the curve section of the, the curve, right? It doesn't make any sense. This, this line here, the elastic modulus really only applies in the linear portion. As you get up to higher and higher portions of the curve where the stress and strain are higher, that's when the material begins to behave non-linearly and the stress and strain are no longer linearly related. Uh, so it doesn't really make sense to talk about the elastic modulus in this, this region where the graph is curved. Uh, especially where it's highly curved, which will come later. But anyway, for now, uh, the point is that different materials have different um, um, stiffnesses. Now, that really, the elastic modulus we just talked about was only good for direct stress and linear strain. Let's go and talk about um, um, shear stress and shear strain. What happens there? Well, there's actually a shear modulus or a stiffness associated with materials uh, resisting shear stresses. So again, think of the jello and applying your hand to the top of the cube of jello and pushing it sideways so that it, it, it um, strains, right? The sides change angle. Uh, so the shear modulus is related to this part. Um, and it's basically just the ratio of the shear stress to the shear strain. So again, it's basically just the load that's causing deflection over the deflection. So if you look at it, the shear modulus, which is given the letter G instead of E, G is the shear stress divided by the shear strain. So we've got, um, similar to what we had before, we've got a force per area, of, think of it as PSI or pressure, divided by a dimensionless thing. So both the elastic modulus E and the shear modulus G have the same units. They're both units of pressure because the denominator is always dimensionless. Now there is actually a relationship between the elastic modulus and the shear modulus and Poisson's ratio, and that's given here on the right-hand side. So you can actually get one from the other if you need it. All right, let's talk about experimental stress analysis. Uh, there's several different ways that stress can be analyzed experimentally. Rather than using a bunch of theory, you can actually apply loads to real geometry and see what happens. And frequently you want to do this when the geometry or the loads are too complicated to apply some theoretical analysis. Um, so there's many different ways to do this, this analytical uh, work. One way is with photoelastic materials, materials that uh, change properties as they're stretched. Okay, You can also apply strain gauges to machines or to components or whatever you need and measure the actual strain, the actual uh, stretching of the material as it's in service. Another way to perform uh, experimental stress analysis is with finite element analysis and that's where you uh, 
uh, approximate, remember we were talking about stress elements and infinitesimal things. Well, what if we took the geometry in, say, a CAD program, pretended that it was made up of a lot of little bitty cubes, tied those cubes together with force, basically, or stress, and then applied loads to see how they respond. Well, basically, you just have a big statics problem with a whole lot of, of little free bodies that are tied to one another, and that would, would work as finite element analysis. That, that's what it is. As a matter of fact, Professor Dews teaches a course, MET 411. I highly recommend. It's a, an applied finite element analysis class. And really, the information you get from 211 is good, but it's not good enough to go out and really perform good stress analysis. You really need finite element analysis. It, today's computers are so powerful, and finite element analysis software is relatively easy to use. You still need this class, 211, to understand what stress and strain are. But finite element analysis really is the icing on the cake. It's, it's the, the workhorse, really, today. Um, and then, of course, for verifying that your predictions actually work, strain gauges are excellent. Photoelastic materials, I've not seen that used a whole lot in my career. Of course, my career in industry, it wasn't all that long, only five years or so. Um, I never really had an occasion to use it. Honestly, I never used strain gauges. I, I did use finite element analysis. Uh, but the problems I was working were simple enough where I really didn't need to do anything else. So photoelastic stress analysis basically uses materials where their optical properties change when stressed. Uh, and polarized light is used to view stress patterns in the material. And you, I mean, you can, you can use photoelastic materials to get a quantitative value of stress, but that's not really their, their normal use or their, their value. Typically what you use a, a photoelastic material to do is to locate regions of high stress. So if you look at the figure in the uh, slides, you'll notice that we've got a wrench here applying torque to some type of nut. And where does the stress occur that's highest? Well, it actually makes sense once you see it that the stress is highest at these opposite points. That makes sense, right? The wrench is trying to turn the nut, so theoretically there's just two contact points. I know you think of a flat wrench as, as contacting the flats on a nut, but in reality, when you start to turn it, there's some clearance there, and that means that there's really only two points of contact. So that's, of course, where the stress is highest. A lot of times, that's the way it goes. You put some photoelastic material on whatever you're, you're studying, and you go, well, yeah, of course, that's where the highest stress is. I see it now. I didn't think of it earlier, but it makes perfect sense now. And I can get other information as well. Notice that there's... Uh, stress lines that are close together from one point to the other side. And that indicates that there's relatively high stress in those areas as well. Basically, where the stress lines are closer, that's where there's higher stress. So this is a very useful tool for more of a qualitative analysis. You can do quantitative analysis, but it requires calibration, and it's usually not beneficial. Strain gauges are in common use. Uh, I haven't used them a lot in my career because in my career, I. I wasn't designing things that uh, were, would typically be overloaded or that had to have a n fairly narrow margin of safety. In fact, my, most of my design work at uh, Amatrol, for example, I just had to make the, ma the machine look good because it wasn't going to experience really high stresses. Uh, there was no point in optimizing how much material was being used. Uh, for example, let's talk about a piping system, right? I mean, there was no reason to use anything other than Schedule 40, even though Schedule 40 was far above what was needed for the pressures that were going to be experienced in the piping system. There was no need to use a big, beefy metal frame, but that was just a standard frame we used. We made a ton of them. It didn't make sense to optimize that design uh, just because the frames did need to be beefy enough so that in transit they didn't get uh, bent, but then they, they would also be stiff enough to be supported however the customer used it. So a lot of that work was already done, and I really didn't have to worry about it. Um, but basically the way you use a strain gauge is to glue it to the, uh, the member that's being tested, and you get a measure of the uh, strain at that point. The way it works is the strain gauge is just a resistor. It's an electrical resistor. And as the resistor is stretched, what happens is its resistance changes. In fact, its resistance goes up. And as long as you uh, know the properties of the gauge, the gauges are made very precisely, and so they're, they're pre-calibrated, basically, is what that means, and the error margin is relatively small. But uh, as long as you know the resistance and you know the properties of that strain gauge, then when you apply it, you glue it in place, you can uh, go from the, um, uh, from the strain you read, or from the resistance you read, directly to a strain, 
And then the stress in the material can be calculated from Young's modulus. As long as you know the, the Young's modulus and you know that the material is not yielding, you're still in the linear portion of the stress-strain curve, well, then you just use the elastic modulus, and there you go. You get the stress. So this is really useful for measuring stress at a point, basically the point where the strain gauge is applied. Uh, I talked a little bit about finite element analysis. Um, the value, in my opinion, the value of this class 211 is so that you can get a back of the envelope calculation uh, or estimate of the stress, and from that, know whether or not the finite element analysis that you're performing is actually accurate or not. Um, you really need to understand how stress and strain work and, and know the various terminology and why the software is only going to give you normal and shear stress. You need to understand those concepts to use the software effectively and you really need to be able to calculate out a, a simplified model to see if the stress and strain numbers you're getting out of the software are in the ballpark of reason. All right, so here's a, the, the good and bad part of finite element analysis is it can give you tons of pretty pictures all day long that everybody likes to look at. What's good about that is you can see where the stresses are highest in the part. The bad thing about it is people tend to trust pictures, so they look at them and they think, oh, well, it looks great, it should be fine. Well, again, garbage in, garbage out. So you really have to know what you're doing with finite element analysis and really with um, strength of materials in general. Now another part of this chapter is design properties of materials. This section should go a little bit faster. Uh, but basically, one of the most important things is the tensile strength of materials. And tensile strength is something that's determined experimentally. And typically what you do is you just increase load on a material, uh, let it strain, and in other words, let it reflect and re uh, deflect, and then record the stress versus strain of that material all the way to failure, typically. So here's a typical diagram for steel. And you'll notice that the first point where the, uh, uh, the, the um, line deviates from a, a linear relationship uh, is marked here, and that's called the proportional limit. That's point A. Uh, the next point is where the stress in the material uh, causes the material to no longer return to its, its original shape. So that's uh, uh, the elastic limit. And then the yield point is where a significant increase in in um, uh, a strain can occur with no increase in stress. So basically what happens is the material just, it's like it just gives. And so that's where the term yield comes from. The material just yields. It's like it, it gives up, okay? So you don't have to apply any more force. The material just slides or seems to slide apart. Um, and then finally, the highest stress the, the material takes before it fractures, before it breaks, uh, is the ultimate strength. Now. In reality, the stress increases, although the load decreases, after the ultimate strength. So the, the ultimate strength might be observed, and then the material just goes on to failure. So you never record any higher stress. Um, so the material actually breaks at a lower stress. There's less load applied because the stretching occurs so quickly that the, 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 the force that's being applied to it can't keep up, and it goes on to fracture. So the ultimate strength is just whatever the highest strength of material uh, exhibits may be. Now, that was a stress strain curve for a typical steel, but there's also high s strength steels and there's also high, uh, well, I'm sorry, there's also titanium and aluminum, and they exhibit a slightly differently shaped stress strain curve. And it's more like what you see on the screen now. So we, we can't really talk about a, a yield point because there's not really a point where the material uh, just gives and seems to, to give up for a while. Uh, instead, we talk about a yield strength, and that yield strength is, you have to s decide where it's gonna be, and the common thing is a 0.2% offset, so a strain of 0 0.002. Notice strain, again, is non-dimensional. So that's usually where we just put a, a stick in the sand and measure it from there, basically, and that's what we call the yield strength. And of course, these materials also exhibit ultimate strengths, where there's a certain maximum strength they're gonna have, and then after that, they, they um, fail. All right, uh, let's see. So the yield strength is a 0.2% offset, and the, the line is just drawn uh, parallel to the linear portion of the stress-strain curve. All right, Hooke's Law, like I said, um, one of the assumptions we make is that we're going to deal primarily in the lower section of those two graphs I showed you, in the section where the stress and strain are linearly related to each other. So Hooke's Law is basically...
uh, the equation that relates stress to strain as long as we're in the, the uh, below the elastic limit. So there's a linear relation in that region, and, and you always want to design for typical operation to be in that region. Where the material might stretch a little bit, it always returns to its original shape. That's not 100% true. There are some things like torque to yield bol bolts that are designed to be yielded, but that's a special case. We'll talk about that in machine elements once you get there. Ductility, however, is another uh, property of materials is very important. Ductility, the, ideal, the idea here is how much can a material give, even yielding, before it finally fractures. So this is up in the upper section of those curves. Um, brittle materials will typically fracture suddenly. So they'll, they'll yield, 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 yield in a, a uh, linear fashion and then finally just snap. Okay, think of things like concrete, glass, uh, stone, things like that typically are, are brittle materials. There's a lot of things like cast iron and uh, steels that are very hard that exhibit brittle uh, behavior. Ductility is actually a valuable property of materials so that if materials are somehow accidentally overloaded, they don't just fail. So they have some, some give that allows the material to, uh, to take abuse and yet not fail. So there's a lot of materials that uh, are not as stiff as brittle materials, but that will uh, exhibit ductile behavior, behavior, and so they're more valuable. So there's a, a brittle failure on the left-hand side and a ductile fracture on the right-hand side in this slide. And ductility is j basically just um, uh, how much permanent elongation there is after fracture. So if a, a material can stretch and stretch and stretch, finally break, and it's stretched a lot and it's remained stretched quite a lot, then it was a fairly ductile material. And here's an example of two materials that were pulled apart in a typical dog bone type test. And one exhibits a cup and cone looking fracture, that's a ductile failure, and the other is a, just a straight line, a, a brittle fracture where the material never yielded, it never gave, it never uh, changed its shape. It was never um, fluid, if you will. It was always just um, uh, brittle. All right, so percent, percent elongation is a measure of ductility, and it's just basically the uh, final length of the specimen minus the initial length, the gauge length, divided by the gauge length, and uh, then multiplied by 100% so that it's a percentage measure. If the percent elongation is more than 5%, then we call it a ductile material. If it's less, we call it brittle. That's just sort of a, another um, marker in the sand, if you will. All right, so there's different types of steels to talk about, and talking about materials. There's, of course, steel is an alloy of iron, carbon, and other elements. There are four classifications of steels. There's carbon steels, alloy, stainless, and structural steels. Here's some uh, typical uh, steels that are in common use for various purposes. I won't go through that. It's just a table from your book. Uh, and heat treatment is basically how you can treat a steel in, or even other materials, uh, aluminum for example, to get the properties you want from them. So uh, quenching is something that's done uh, to, to generate high strength and hard materials, typically very brittle. Tempering, uh, which is a process after quenching, is something that improves ductility. Uh, normalizing a material has more to do with the grain structure to get good properties like ductility and machinability. Uh, full annealing is where you can take a, a, a part, for example, and make it very soft so you can form it, you can machine it, you can do all kinds of things with it. But stress relief annealing is something where you're not fully annealing, but you're removing some of the residual stresses from quenching or tempering or whatever it may be, and typically helps prevent distortion. Now, you guys probably know more about heat treatment than I know. I've studied heat treatment. That was back in college. I haven't taught courses on materials for a while, so Professor Dews is probably a lot better at telling you about heat treatment. But basically, these are just treatments that can be used to change the properties of material. So if you know, for example, that a material has a certain alloy in it, you still don't know everything you need to know about the material. Just because you know the chemical composition, that doesn't tell you everything about the steel or the aluminum. In fact, you can go down to the lab and we have an x-ray gun there that's just a material property thing. And please don't use it unless you know how to use it. It can be dangerous. It's got a lot of safety features. That's good. but you have to be trained on it to know how to use it properly. But anyway, you can use this x-ray gun and get the chemical composition of a, a material, a metal, very easily, but you still really don't know the properties of that material because you don't know what its heat treatment was. So measuring things like the hardness, taking a sample of the material, measuring its uh, ultimate strength, its uh, properties like that, 
uh, will give you a better uh, measure of that material. Stainless steel, I don't know a lot about the various stainless steels. Stainless steels are typically corrosion resistant. The main alloying element is chromium. Um, average apparently is about 17% chromium. You can get low stainless steels, high. Uh, the 300 series is high strength and ductile and it's non-magnetic. There are some st stainless steels that are magnetic and there's a lot of people in the world that don't know that. There's some stainless steels that will rust and again a lot of people don't know that. But uh, stainless basically is a, a steel that's alloyed with chromium. All right, uh, structural steel is not a whole lot different. Okay, that's not true. It is different. It's its own class, but it's, it's closer in properties to typical steels you would buy for making machined parts. In fact, you can use structural steel to make machined parts. But typically, structural sh uh, steel is hot is either hot rolled. Uh, cold rolled or cold drawn, and it's typically used for making structure. That's what's called structural steel. Think of the framework for a skyscraper or uh, a crane or anything like that. Typically, structural steel is what will be used. If it's hot rolled, it'll be relatively soft, relatively low strength. It'll have high ductility and it'll be easy to form. Cold rolled, on the other hand, has higher strength but less ductility. Cold drawn has the high, highest strength, but again, won't, won't stretch much to failure. Uh, this is classified by ASTM and A36 is probably the uh, a common uh, carbon steel. Aluminum I know even less about. Uh, I'll refer you to the book for this and ask you to read this section. I, you typically don't assign reading from the book. I let students use a textbook as a reference most of the time. I would ask you to go into chapter 2 and read the sections that talk about materials. Once again, you guys probably know more about it than I do and you really just need a refresher uh, about the various types. Um, I know that for aluminum, a common aluminum is 6160. It has relatively good machinability properties, relatively good strengths. It's the one I've designed out of more than anything. But there's many different series of aluminums, and basically what changes is the alloying element. Um, there's also a temper designation uh, to tell how the material was treated after uh, being formed. And it can be cold worked, it can be heat treated, uh, and there's letters here to indicate O is fully annealed, H is strain hardened, and T is heat treated. So that's another designation that typically goes behind the alloy uh, of the material so that you know what you've got. All right, so that's everything for this chapter. One thing to note is that the homework for chapter two is all on Blackboard. It's all online. It's not something where you work out paper problems and submit it to me. So make sure that you look for that in the um, second learning module. No, I guess this would be the third because we had an introductory learning module. So the learning module associated with chapter two. Make sure you look at that and that should be it. Thanks.